Hello beautiful and welcome to makeup. Which one of you did this? Which one of you bought me my eggs? <laughs> which one of you watched my history of the beauty community part 2 video? Which which one of you sent me these? Usually I save my PO box stuff for a fan mail unboxing but I saw the name! I saw that it was Beauty Bakery and y'all made me have emotions in a post office. I teared up in a post office. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. I don't know who's done this, but thank you so much because I, I'm so excited. Oh, my heart melting. These are so cute. <laughs> thank you so much to whoever sent these to me. I'm gonna be using them today. I'm so freaking excited. This has made my week. This has made my year. Hello beautiful and welcome back to Watercooler Convo Makeup where I talk about the things that you want me to talk about, where I talk about the things that I want me to talk about and sometimes we meet in the middle and I talk about the things that we want me to talk about as I do my makeup and today I'm so excited for this video. I'm so excited for this video because I, I know that I'm going to be having so much fun and I hope that you have fun with me because I've said it before, I don't want a Swiss cheese brain, I want a brie cheese brain so if there is a hole, a pocket in my knowledge, I want to fill it. Must be filled. And with it being Pride Month, I realize that I know far too little about the history of the LGBTQIA plus community as well as Pride Month and Pride itself and it just it didn't sit right with me. So I've researched all month in the hopes to educate myself and I thought that I would just bring you along for the fun little journey, the fun little ride, the fun little education experience that I was making for myself. And wildly in a community post that I made asking what fun videos you wanted me to talk about, quite a few of you asked for me to do a history of pride. So are you in my brain? Do you have the passwords to my computer? What are your secrets? How do you know these things? <laughs> But even though there is still a lot of progress to be made because any level of discrimination is just far too much, at the same time over the last hundred-ish years there has still been an incredible amount of progress and I think that should be celebrated. Which... is that not what Pride Month is, JJ? <laughs> And I've saved this video to the end of the month to be uploaded on the 28th of June because today marks the 52nd anniversary of the Stonewall Inn raids and riots. Disclaimer and content warning, in this video I will be discussing the history of the LGBTQAI plus community, specifically the history of Pride and Pride Month. In this video I will have discussions of discrimination towards the LGBTQAI plus community as well as the assassination of Harvey Milk and discussions of the HIV and AIDS epidemic in the 80s that is still ongoing to this day. I will also have mentions of different articles and interviews from the past highlighting events that I am discussing in this video. Some of the articles that I will be quoting will be very homophobic, transphobic in their intent, phrasing, and are just very discriminative. I do not agree with any of the homophobia and I do not agree with any of the transphobia from these quotes, but to give context I will be quoting a few of them without the slurs. If you find any of the topics in this video possibly triggering, please proceed with caution or consider clicking off of the video altogether because I do not want my content to jeopardize your happiness and jeopardize your well-being. Also in the description of this video, I will be leaving all of the links that I used to research for this video so if you're interested in reading, listening to, watching, go ahead, they are there for you but also I've left a few little other fun ones that you might find fascinating. With all of that said and done, let's get on to the video! In all honesty, I think this is probably going to be one of my favourite videos because there is just so much that I didn't know. I didn't know about the sip-in, I didn't even really know what the Stonewall in raids or riots were, I didn't know anything about the HIV or AIDS epidemic or even the memorial quilt that got made with it. I legitimately thought that when Rue in RuPaul's Drag Race said, in the tradition of Paris is burning, reading is fundamental, I thought that he legit meant that a library in Paris had burnt down. Why would Rue be quoting a library in Paris burning down? That doesn't make sense. Like that, that, that doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, but you know what? That's fine. That's, that's my lack of knowledge that I've just now hopefully filled. Either way, I digress. This is of course not a full history of the LGBTQAI plus community. This isn't a full history of the rights. This isn't a full history of pride. This isn't a full history of anything. This is the tip of the iceberg because the history of the LGBTQAI plus community is so unique and so different to every single country and to every single individual. Each country has their own timeline 
timeline, each country has their own story. Each individual has their own story and their own perspective of the community and of the history and of the rights. And to me personally, the history of the LGBTQAI plus community looks like a tree. The intricate roots are the history of each individual and each country. The trunk of it is the community today in its present at its core. And the leaves and all of the foliage that comes off of it is the future. And that's what it just looks like to me. And I hope that that imagery makes sense to everyone. But even though it makes sense up here, it doesn't mean that I'm communicating it properly. But even though this isn't a full history, it's still a piece of the puzzle. And it's one that I just wanted to bring you all along for. I just wanted to bring you all along for my journey and my education. So let's go. And I understand at the moment that my makeup looks a little bit crazy. Um, and it would look so much better if my hand stopped shaking. My basic plan for this is, is because I'm doing a history of prior video, I want to make the makeup match the history of it so I'm putting on liquid latex and then putting my base over the top and peeling it off so that it will kind of look like stones maybe we will see because I want to give a nod to the Stonewall in raids and riots and then do the OG pride flag just because I I kind of love in a heartbreaking way, the story behind that. The most widely accepted and noted turning point of the LGBTQ plus community's rights and the birthplace of Pride was Stonewall in raids and riot. But before I get to what happened that night and what happened after and also the first Pride celebration, I wanna just set up what the USA looked like and specifically New York looked like in terms of discrimination and just what it was like to be a part of the community in that time. But through my research, it was primarily homosexuality and transgender targeting. For a large part of the 20th century, it was actually illegal to be gay, specifically sodomy and soliciting homosexual relations. It was also illegal to be transgender, but it was legal to discriminate against someone who was openly a part of the LGBTQAI plus community. It was also illegal to serve of a member of the community alcohol due to the repeal of prohibition in 1933. It gave the power to the State Liquor Authority of New York to revoke any liquor license of any owner who suffered or permitted their premises to become disorderly. This disorderly behavior included anyone who was openly homosexual or someone who was impersonating the opposite gender. Gloria's Bar and Grill in 1939 was actually shut down by the SLA because of this. Because according to the SLA, Gloria's Bar and Grill was permitting homosexuals, degenerates and other undesirable people to congregate on their premises. So because of this law, other laws, and the rampant homophobia and transphobia of the time, a lot of people refused to serve members of the community in fear of being shut down or just because they were straight up discriminative, homophobic, and transphobic. Which means that nearly all gay bars were shut down at the time. And I say nearly because some gay bars still managed to function and run as private bottle clubs, which means that you didn't need a liquor license to run. When there's a will, there's a way kind of situation. Quick little sidebar because it it is coming up on camera. I can see it in the viewfinder. I have used this liquid latex several times. I have used other brands of liquid latex several times and I've never ever had an issue with it. But today my skin is starting to go really red underneath, which is one of the first signs for me personally of an allergic reaction. So I'm going to go pop a Telfast wait 20 minutes and then carry on with this video. But on top of this, in 1950, there was also the Lavender Scare. The Lavender Scare declared that homosexuals and other sexual perverts were national security risks. This created mass panic over homosexual citizens and actually allowed for businesses to terminate employment of known homosexual employees, strictly based on their sexuality. This entire ordeal is very similar to the Red Scare, but also incredibly and scarily similar to Trump's ban on transgender troops from serving in the US military. Then in 19 1968, the second edition of the American Classification of Mental Disorders was published and published homosexuality as a mental disorder, to then be relisted in 1973 by the APA as a sexual orientation disorder. Not until 1987 was homosexuality completely removed from being a disorder. And it wasn't until 2019 where being transgender wasn't recognized as being a mental disorder. With all of that context and that sidebar, let's get back to the 60s, specifically April 21st, 1966. April 21st, 1966. Dick Leish, who I hope I am pronouncing that name properly. Dick was the leader of the New York chapter of the Mattachine Society. The Mattachine Society was one of America's earliest gay rights organizations, founded in 1950 and originally known as the Mattachine Foundation. So Dick, as well as two other members of the Mattachine Society, being Craig Rodwell and Randy Wicker, attempted to challenge the SLA's discrimination against homosexuals. With a change in mayor, as well as with help from the American Civil Liberties Union and also publication houses that the society had reached out to to cover the plan, 
planned event. The plan was to be denied service strictly on the fact that all of the gentlemen were homosexuals. And after three failed attempts, the gentlemen finally found success at a bar called Julius, which was actually only a few blocks down the road from Stonewall. All of the men went in in an orderly manner, they ordered their drinks, declared that they were gay, and the bartender denied them service strictly on the fact that they were gay and not because they were being disorderly. This then sparked what is known as the Sip-In, which was inspired by the civil rights movements of sit-ins. This then started a human rights battle between the three men being Dick, Craig, and Randy, as well as Julius, the bar, and the SLA. The SLA at first, of course, denied any claims of discrimination. But when the Human Rights Commission got involved, the SLA folded the teeniest tiniest bit and revised their discrimination policy. So because of this, the SLA went from classifying homosexuality as disorderly to classifying same-sex relations and impersonating another gender as disorderly. So it was no longer disorderly to be homosexual, but it was disorderly to display it and to gender impersonate. The absolute audacity. Two men holding hands. Ah, despicable. Two women dancing. <gasps> How dare you? Hugging? Kissing? The world must be ending. Either way, I digress. Even though there was less discrimination now, it was still seemingly incredibly hard to go out into New York and enjoy the nightlife if you were a member of the community. Because the unjustified homophobia, transphobia, negative stigma, but also police targeting. At the time, there was an unofficial rule known as the three item rule. Simply, it just meant that each individual person at all times had to be wearing at least three items of gender appropriate attire. Otherwise, police would be able to identify you as a part of the community. Typically, they would arrest you for impersonating someone of the opposite gender, or they would arrest you for displaying homosexual relationships, or they would falsely accuse you of a crime and lock you up. If you were lucky, you would leave with no scratches or bruises, no marks on you anywhere, but most weren't so lucky. But regardless, people still wanted to have fun. They still wanted to party. They still wanted to dance. They just still wanted to enjoy themselves. So the mob found a profit margin. I told you, I had... No knowledge when it came to the history. This one I wasn't expecting. <laughs> In 1966, I can't find a specific date though, so it could have been purchased and running before the sip-in, but it might not have been. But regardless, in 1966, the Genovese crime family purchased Stonewall and ran it as a gay bar. <laughs> The crime family ran it like a private bottle club, which meant that they could operate without a liquor license and they opened themselves up to the LGBTQAI plus community. But behind closed doors, they operated it like every other bar in New York City. And the crime family would pay off corrupt cops in New York City's sixth precinct to either turn a blind eye or to give them a heads up when there was about to be a raid. That way they could hide all the illegal behavior before the cops showed up. This made Stonewall one of the only functioning gay clubs in New York City and actually became quite a safe haven for the community. A very unlikely friendship, and a bit of a toxic one at that as well, because the crime family was known for blackmailing wealthier patrons and threatening to out them in society. So I don't agree with that, but I found it quite interesting that the mob was like, oh, well we don't really care as long as we make money. So with all of this context, all of this history, we finally get to the evening of June 28th, 1969, which was the raid and riots of Stonewall Inn. The Stonewall Inn had been raided before, but as I said before, the crime family was paying off corrupt cops, so typically they got some sort of a heads up so that they could hide all of the illegal behavior. But for some reason on this night, they weren't given a heads up. So armed with a warrant, police raided and stormed into the Stonewall Inn, finding illicit homosexual behavior, gender impersonation, nation, gender inappropriate attire, operating without a liquor license, bootlegged alcohol, they roughed up so many patrons and workers as well as arrested 13 people. From a lot of historical accounts and interviews of the night, the Stonewall Inn riot and raid was said to be spontaneous because it's not the first time a gay bar has been raided in New York and it wasn't the first time that Stonewall Inn was either. Most times that gay bars were raided, patrons would flee the scene in the hopes to avoid arrest, harassment and brutality. Yet this time patrons, workers, neighbors, onlookers circled the Stonewall Inn and rioted. It's documented that the turning point of this raid was when police were trying to forcefully push a lesbian into the back of a patrol car and possibly even hit her over the head in the process. The crowd around Stonewall Inn, which approximated 400 people who watched police do this, started shouting police brutality, started tossing pennies, stones, bottles, bricks at police. After decades of discrimination, police harassment, police targeting, 
police brutality, people had had enough and people decided to fight. As I said, it first started with shouting and eventually it turned into throwing pennies, stones, bricks, bottles, impromptu firebombs. <laughs> Such an incredible riot was occurring that police, the people that they arrested, a writer for the Village Voice, had to barricade themselves inside the Stonewall Inn to await backup. Incredible! There are even accounts that rioters actually used a parking meter as a battering ram to breach the barricade. Amazing! There are varied accounts of who actually threw the first piece of debris or brick when it came to the riot, but regardless, the night was ignited by the power, by the voice of the LGBTQAI plus community. It was also apparently the mob, the people who owned the Stonewall Inn, who managed to successfully ignite the building in flames whilst backup was coming. Backup police and fire department did eventually arrive to extinguish the flames, but also disperse the crowd. Apparently a riot squad actually marched down Christopher Street in order to apprehend the crowd, but the crowd was way too smart for the riot squad because they circled the village and surprised them from behind. <laughs> it wasn't until sometime after 4am when the flames were successfully extinguished and the crowd was dispersed. The names that are tied incredibly strongly and for very good reason to the Stonewall riots are Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. These two women are seen as pioneers for the gay liberation movement and are praised for everything they have done for the community. If you are interested, one thing that I would definitely recommend is watching the Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson documentary. It's a really sad watch, but it's a really good watch. There is just so much information in that documentary and a lot of it from first person perspective as well. It goes into the death and life of Marsha, but also of Sylvia Rivera as well. And I, in all honesty, cannot do the history of these women justice. And it it's definitely like an hour of my life that I was happy to lose watching it. So if you are interested, I would definitely recommend watching it. Just be cautious because there is a lot of heavy information in that documentary. And speaking of Marsha, it's actually been said for decades that she was the one who threw the first brick when it came to Stonewall. But in interviews later, she actually specifies that the riot was already occurring before she got there. So just a cute little fun fact that I found out. But with the flames quenched and the crowds dispersed, police thought it was over. It wasn't. <laughs> because the community took advantage of this moment in history to make their strength shown, to make their power shown, and to make their voices heard. With protests lasting over five days, some in front of Stonewall Inn and some in front of press houses. Some of the protests were met with police harassment and brutality, with some of the crowds being beaten and tear gassed. But it still took until the early hours for the crowds to be dispersed. With the press being as homophobic and as transphobic as they were back in that era, press houses like New York Times and Village Voice resorted to to using transphobic and homophobic slurs as catchy titles to sell their magazines and newspapers. Using slurs as catchy titles to report the audacity of the LGBTQAI plus community. Hence why one of the protests on July 2nd was actually held outside of Village Voice Press House with a lot of protesters threatening to burn down the press house. With this specific protest, once again, protesters were met with police brutality and it ended just around midnight. But these six days, the first being the Stonewall Raid and Riot, and the five days of protest to follow galvanized the LGBTQAI plus community and also the gay rights movement. The community now knew that they needed to be louder and they needed to be more visible. So activist Craig Rodwell, his partner Fred Sargent, Ellen Boddy and Linda Rhodes all proposed that a march be held in celebration of the anniversary of the Stonewall Inn raids and riots. This march was to be held to immortalize the events at the Stonewall Inn raids and riots and was proposed to the ERCHO and was approved. Activists Activist Brenda Howard is one of the most celebrated people when it comes to the organization of the first Pride and first March with the help of Craig Rodwell. Brenda Howard was actually the person who proposed and organized for this march to be more than a march and actually a week-long celebration that started with the march. And with the help of the Oscar Wilde mailing list being Craig Rodwell's bookshop, they were able to get this message out. The first Pride event in New York was actually known as the Christopher Street Liberation Day March. This week-long celebration of what happened at Stonewall also included a gay inn which is once again inspired 
inspired by the civil rights movement of sit-ins, and it wasn't only just a celebration, but also a test. A test to see what happens when the community is loud and visible. The New York March was said to have 1,000 to 20,000 people attending, but depending on the source that you read depends really on the numbers that you get. But regardless, the march was said to have stretched 51 blocks between 6th Avenue at Waverly Place in Greenwich Village to Sheep's Meadow in Central Park where the gay inn was held. This demonstration was the largest LGBTQAI plus community demonstration that has ever existed. And with New York celebrating and immortalizing the events of the Stonewall Inn raids and riots, other states followed. Chicago actually started celebrating the day before New York, having gay dances, speeches, and work workshops. Chicago's festivities ended with approximately 150 people marching. This march was between Washington Square Park to the Water Tower between Michigan and Chicago, with some even marching on to the Civic Center. Chicago's week-long festivities were organized by the Gay Liberation Movement, and the official slogan was Gay Power. On the same day as New York, San Francisco marched down Polk Street and held a gay inn at Golden Gate Park. And from here, Pride became an annual celebration, growing in numbers and evolving with the times. Each state having its own individual history. And it specifically San Francisco's history that debuted the original Pride flag. At San Francisco's Gay Freedom Day Parade on June 5th, 1978, the original Pride flag created and designed by artist Gilbert Baker with the help of 30 volunteers was unveiled. And it became a global symbol of pride in the LGBTQ plus community, replacing the symbol of the pink triangle. Even though the community had and has reclaimed the symbol of the pink triangle and given new meaning to it, there is still so much pain and suffering attached to this symbol back then and still to this day. So Gilbert Baker was actually commissioned by San Francisco's politician Harvey Milk to design and create a new pride flag. Harvey Milk, if you haven't heard of him, has played a crucial part in the gay rights movement, but also a crucial part in the LGBTQAI plus community. Being one of the first openly gay elected officials in US politics, but the first openly gay elected official in California's history. But heartbreakingly, Harvey Milk was actually assassinated in his office November 27th, 1978 by resigned supervisor Dan White, who also assassinated Mayor Moscone at the same time in the same building to only serve eight years for manslaughter for his crimes in the assassination of both Mayor Moscone and Harvey Milk. There is of course a lot more to Harvey Milk than just his assassination, so if you do want to know more about the LGBTQAI plus community, the rights and the history behind it, I encourage you to look up Harvey Milk. There is links in my description, of course, as I specified before. But back to the pride flag. As I was saying, Harvey Milk commissioned artist Gilbert Baker to design and create a new pride flag. Because to Gilbert, the flag for the LGBTQAI plus community had to represent all of the people within the community. The flag needed to represent the togetherness of the community because the community was made up of all people, all people of different races, genders, and ages, as well as rainbows being both natural and beautiful. Each original color in the pride flag represented something different. Hot pink was for sex, red was for life, orange was for healing, yellow was for sunlight, green was for nature, turquoise was for art, indigo was for harmony, and violet was for spirit. The flag was accepted and celebrated by the crowd at the Gay Freedom Day celebration of San Francisco in 1978. Baker then took the flag later to Paramount Flags where hot pink and turquoise would be replaced by blue for practicality reasons. But something devastatingly poetic is that the demand for the pride flag actually rapidly increased after the assassination of Harvey Milk, helping it to become this globally recognized symbol we all know today. But many actually attribute the acceleration of the gay rights movement to the HIV and AIDS epidemic that started in 1981. This acceleration unfortunately being paid for with people's lives. A New York Times article in 1981 actually wrote of 41 homosexual men being diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, with eight of them passing away within 24 months of their diagnosis. This article coined the term gay cancer, even though there was quickly reports that this cancer was being found in heterosexuals as well. And at this point the world was completely unaware of HIV and AIDS. AIDS and the battle ahead to find the cure. That today, 40 years later, a cure is yet to be specifically found. And I say specifically because there are treatments and medication to stop or at least hinder HIV from becoming AIDS. So there has been some progress, but there is still a lot of progress to go in finding a cure for HIV and AIDS. It's said in many articles and interviews from survivors and loved ones of the people who passed away during this epidemic, that most people, if not all people who were diagnosed with HIV and AIDS were treated with outcome compassion. Some medical professionals even refused to go near patients diagnosed with HIV and 
AIDS, a level of hysteria that was costing people their lives. And to make it worse, the government saw no need to take this accelerating epidemic seriously in the first few years. It wasn't until September of 1985 where US President Ronald Reagan said AIDS for the first time to the press. And at this point, AIDS had claimed over 8,400 lives and was affecting 16,400 people in the US alone. So with all of this in context, it's no surprise that the LGBTQAI plus community started to protest. Discrimination, homophobia, and transphobia was already something of the unfortunate norm and at times already fatal. But with the lack of medical understanding and also the inhumane treatment of those who were diagnosed, being diagnosed with AIDS or HIV became a death sentence. Just to give a bit more context to the rapid increase between 1984 and 1985, there was an 89% increase in cases. Terry Breswick, a director of the GLBT Historical Society and a founding member of ACT UP specifies, the AIDS epidemic galvanized the gay rights movement, bringing people and groups out of the closet because this was no longer a fight for equal rights, but a fight for survival. The LGBTQAI plus community was now fighting for their lives. So even though the community had been marching and celebrating the events of the Stonewall riots, as well as protesting to legalize sodomy and legalize marriage and just rights in their entirety, with this rising death toll increased organization. There was more marches, more protests, more organizations and foundations created. There was more fundraising in the hopes to find a cure and to stop this epidemic, which 40 years later is heartbreakingly still ongoing. There are a lot of lives that have been taken by this epidemic and a lot of those lives have been immortalized in the AIDS memorial quilt. Gay rights activist Cleve Jones in 1987 teamed up with Mike Smith and Gert McMullen and others to form the Names Project Foundation, who made it their mission to show America what they were trying to ignore. Because as Cleve has said in interviews, it would be incredibly hard to ignore the thousands of bodies of those who were taken by AIDS if they were all laid out in the sun in front of them. Cleve, like so many other members of the LGBTQAI plus community, had to watch their loved ones die and watch them die as no one cared. Which is how this memorial quilt came to be. Each panel of the quilt is three foot by six foot, which is the average size of an adult's grave. And each one is decorated individually for a person who has passed away due to the epidemic. And each quilt piece is sent in by the loved ones of those who have passed. October 11th, 1987 was the first unveiling of the AIDS Memorial Quilt. This first unveiling had 1920 quilt panels. And in 2020, the AIDS Memorial Quilt is an incredible 54 ton tapestry made up of over 50,000 quilt pieces dedicated to over 105,000 individuals, which is only scratching the surface to those who have lost their lives during the AIDS epidemic. As I said before, this fight for survival, this fight for people's lives is said to be one that brought the LGBTQAI plus community out into the open more so than ever before. With more organization, fundraising, protests, and marches than there has ever been before. It is devastating to see and to hear at what cost, but it is said that it has allowed for the strength that is still seen in the community today. But in my research, I've seen so many interviews of founding members from organizations, protests, and ball houses from Paris is Burning, from Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, who are seen as pioneers of the Stonewall in riots, but also of the gay rights movement, all specifying that even though there has been so much progress for the LGBTQAI plus community, there are still so many being left behind in compassion, recognition, and rights. Many of these articles and interviews specifying the POC and trans community. With so many of these founding members and pioneers passing, so much history and power passes with them. A lot, if not all, specify that the community can only succeed if they all succeed. Then in 1999, US President Bill Clinton declared that June will be the first ever official gay pride month and declared the same in 2000. President Bush did not follow and remained silent on the matter. However, President Obama declared June to be the LGBT Pride Month for each year of his terms, being from 2009 to 2016. Trump did follow by declaring June be Pride Month, however, he did discontinue flying the Pride flag at government buildings as well as lighting the lighthouse up in Pride colors. And once again with Biden, June has been declared as Pride Month. Ultimately, this is not a full history of Pride. This isn't even a full history of Pride in the USA. This is only a small amount of puzzle pieces in the grand scheme of things. I still have 
so much to learn about the community as a whole and with pride and with each individual country. Because each country has its own individual timeline and history when it comes to the rights and recognition of the LGBTQAI plus community. April 1st, 2001, the Netherlands became the first country to legalize same-sex marriage. But in Australia where I live, it wasn't until December 9th, 2017 where same-sex marriage was legalized. I don't think my education or education for the LGBTQAI plus community or human rights as a whole will ever be concluded. Because as I said before, so many founding members of organizations, history organizations and liberation pioneers have passed and take with them their power and their history. With the way that technology was in the 20th century, a lot if not all of the history wasn't or couldn't be recorded. Some because of the lack of technology as I just specified, but some because of the homophobia and transphobia of that era. So much of the press and media were against the community. So when the history was recorded in newspapers and articles, a lot of it villainized the community. Recording the discrimination at the time as justified because the community was perverted and diseased or disorderly. But regardless, looking back at history, we can see how much we have progressed and celebrate, but also see how much there is still left to go. And with all of that said, that is everything. That is all of it in one little video. But as I have said so many times in this video, that isn't really everything, but it's everything so far. That is my education and learning so far. And I just hope that you have enjoyed coming on this cute little adventure with me. But also in this video, I haven't even put in everything that I've researched, learned and watched. As I said before, I watched the Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson documentary and Ooh, she was she was really heavy and really intense, don't get me wrong, but also it was a really fascinating watch. I I really enjoyed that documentary in a really heartbreaking way. As I've said so many times in so many videos, I just like learning. I When I find a little hole in my understanding, a hole in my Swiss cheese brain, I want to fill it. I want to fill it. I want to understand. I love knowing about the world I'm living in. I love knowing about the people that are in the world that I'm living in. And I understand that even though it's a sad, unfortunate fact, not all history of the world I'm living in and the people that are around me is going to be happy uplifting and joyous. I know that sometimes it's going to be heartbreaking and devastating, but I still want to know it and understand it even though for a moment in time I may be sad. Because for me personally, I don't see the point in avoiding understanding a piece of history just because it's not happy, because it's going to be devastating and heartbreaking and it's possibly going to make me sad to understand it. But regardless, please let me know what you think of this video. Please let me know what you think of all the things that I discussed. Please let me know if you think that there's something that I've missed out on. Oh no, actually yes. If there is something that you think that I've missed or if you think that there is something that you think that I would find fascinating to read and educate myself on, please let me know down in the comments because I, I am, I am really in the like research zone. I, I wrote these notes and I kept going. <laughs> But also please let me know what you want me to talk about because even though I know what I want to research and I know what I want me to talk about, I still want to know what you want me to talk about. I still want to know what you want me to research because there may be some holes in my knowledge that I don't know exist yet unless you comment. But while you're letting me know all of that, please also let me know what you think of my face. Ah! This looks so freaking cute. Look at my face right now. Look at my face right now. I'm not really sure if I'm liking the brick formation kind of system that's going on with my base makeup at the moment, but I wanted to give a cheeky nod to Stonewall and the bricks being thrown and just a cheeky little nod to the history of the LGBTQAI plus community and the history of Pride. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm not convinced that I will be doing brick makeup again, if that makes sense. But the eyes, though, those hearts are so freaking cute. I hope that you can see that. Like, does that, is that not cute? I love this eye makeup and my little cloud highlight. I love this makeup. I feel so cute. I feel, I feel so cute. 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 I feel so powerful. Fight me right now. I am made of bricks. You will lose. You will lose. I am so powerful. I am so cute. So scrum diddly freaking numptious. But with all of that, I hope that you are feeling as fantastic as I am. I hope that you are having a fantastic day, a fantastic week, a fantastic month, a fantastic year. And I hope that you are having a happy and safe Pride Month. Bye, everyone.